cold, dead silence. That was all I ever heard in the hospital. I sat alone in the evaluation room, somewhere I knew all too well. While waiting for my regular doctor, I had taken the time to count the tiles in the floor and estimate the perimeter of the room. I listened to the occasional padding of people's feet in the hallway. I always knew the difference between a patient and a doctor. The doctor often sounded like the footsteps were rushed and light, a patient's were slow and heavy. That sound often lingered until the next step was taken. I mentally compared them to my own. I heard the doorknob click, and the heavy iron door opened. Shasta? A soft female voice said as she entered, closing the door behind her. I looked over, away from staring at nothing in particular in the direction of the wall in front of me. Dr. Ramos? Said I, my eyes following her as she sat across from me at the table, just in the center of the evaluation room. The walls were roughly four feet thick. Nobody could hear from the hallway or the room next to it. But even still, I could hear through the door. I suppose I was just trying to tune into something to drown out the ringing in my ears from the silence of the room. Dr. Ramos was a beautiful woman, admittedly. She was thin, with slightly tanned skin and dark brown hair. Her eyes were light brown. She always had her hair either tied back in a long ponytail or a round bun. This particular day, she had the bun look going. She looked through my stuffed files from the previous days. I remember when I asked about them, and she said she was instructed to record everything that went on in this room. Even I figured that they had to be terribly boring. Are you ready to begin, Shasta? She asked me gently. I glanced over the documents and my general profiles, not even aware of half the things in those. How do you feel today? Fine. I answered with no emotion. I never really answered differently. For a while, I was suspected as suicidal or something because I would answer this and then supposedly act different to the other questions. To me, that was stupid. But I answered this because it was true. I was actually generally fine. Dr. Ramos took a moment to write, myself listening to the scribbles like always. I could tell when she was either writing in cursive or print. If she was writing in cursive, the scribbles had a straight flow and periodically stopped for punctuation. Print was usually about three seconds of scribbling, then stopped, then start again. I never had to glance at the paper to know. Any feeling of nausea... Headaches? Is your anxiety getting any better? She asked me. I nodded slowly, not really paying too much attention to her. I had been suffering slight anxiety as of that time, and she prescribed me a pill to take, and she ran it through the hospital's pharmacy to deliver to my room when I needed it. The spells were not too horrible, but it sometimes caught me off guard, to say the least. Have you been sleeping all right? Dr. Ramos asked. I rolled my eyes at her and looked her in the eyes. She always asked me this. A question she knew the answer to already. I don't sleep, Dr. Ramos. I told her. She shook her head a little. I've seen you sleep, Shasta, she remarked. It is rare, yes, but... I know you do. I don't really sleep, I responded with a slight snap. I go into a state of unawareness, and then I come back about an hour later. Ever since I got here, I trailed off. I had not had a decent amount of sleep in nearly a year. This damned hospital was sure to be the death of me. I knew it. Dr. Ramos just nodded slowly. She was like every doctor here. They never really take patients like me seriously, but rather take our words with a grain of salt. I guess it's because they all think that us as patients think we know everything. 
when really most of us are just waiting to see if they will really listen and help, or just generally try to push us to the point of no return. I had seen a patient or two like that in the time that I had been here. I wondered if I would end up like that. Well, let's see if you're up to talking about why you're here in the first place. Hmm? Dr. Ramos finally said after about five minutes straight of scribbling. I returned to resting my head on my hand, and I allowed a sigh to slip my lips. What's the use? I asked. Every time you do this, I tell you the same thing. I know nothing. Shasta, she began. You and I both know that you're still dealing with the trauma you experienced. I know that losing your brother was hard on you. He's happy now, I simply remarked. How stupid. They always play the sympathy card, pretending to be on your side for about ten minutes before getting to the root of the reason you're sitting in a mental institution. I'm not worried, Ramos. Dr. Ramos looked at me with pure annoyance, which I found a crude humor in. I hid it behind a straight face, but I was mentally smirking. Your parents were killed in a car accident when you were twelve, right? She asked. Yes. Your brother was about 18, and he was the only family you had left. I nodded. Other than my senile grandmother in a nursing home, yes, I answered. It was always questions and answers I could recite like a script. Every single question she asked me each day was almost always the same. You live with your brother until you're about 16, and then the incident occurred. I nodded. I began to feel a little uncomfortable with the conversation at this point. I always did. You see, I cared a lot about my brother. He was about the nicest guy anyone ever could know. And Derek was really the best sibling I could ask for, but he suffered a lot once our parents died. He dropped out of college for me and just took up a job with the closest convenience store. It's a shame, really. Do you remember what happened that night, Shasta? Dr. Ramos asked me, and I bit my lip out of anxiety. I glanced around the room as I began to repeat the story. He came home from work one day. He looked upset and tired. Rebecca, his girlfriend of seven years, had just broken up with him the day before, and, well, I knew he was at a breaking point. He began to smoke a lot more than he had been. I wanted to trail off and stop at this point, but every time, Dr. Ramos would somehow find a way to push me. I did not want to keep reliving it all. Not like this. I don't want to talk anymore. Just please, Dr. Ramos begged me. I felt something like anxiety pulse through me, and I glanced down at my lap. My hands were folded. I had been twiddling my thumbs. You'll never get better if you always stop in the middle of your story. She continued to nag me. I said, I'm done. I said, a little snippily. This was a normal thing, unfortunately for me. Can I just go back to my room? No, Shasta. Dr. Ramos said. You have to keep going. How can I help you if you don't tell me what happened? I wanted to cry, scream, anything. And I guess this is what people would call having a panic attack. I just wanted out of there and away from my doctor. I felt sick to my stomach. Please, I need to get back to my room. I pleaded, my voice shaking. I think my face flushed by then because I almost felt the contents of my stomach come back up my throat. I ended up vomiting all over myself, but, well, the rest is blurry. I think I remember Dr. Ramos getting on her radio and calling for more doctors to come and help me. God, not again. When I came to, I was back in my room. One of the doctors had managed to change my scrubs for me and I sat up in bed slowly. I think my roommate was in an evaluation room too, unless she was getting therapy again. 
This always happens. And I cannot ever get better because I always have some kind of attack before I could get to my subconsciousness and spit out my story. I knew what I did, but I never admitted it aloud. And I guess I'm just not meant to ever get better. What's the use in being in a psych ward if I can't get better? I looked out the window, the setting sun the only thing illuminating my room. I got up and looked out. I looked down, remembering that I was on the third floor. I began to wonder. Maybe I can get away. This ward is built a little ways from a forest, and that alone aligns with the main roads. I could maybe get somewhere away from here. I know. If I jumped, it would be a leap of faith. It was then I remembered the roll of gauze I kept at my bedside table. I hurried over to it, opened the drawer, and retrieved it. As I went back to the window, I began to rethink myself. Can I do this? I eyed the window, which had widely set bars. Some people probably could not get through, but thanks to me losing an excessive amount of weight since I've been there, I could easily slip through. Cautiously, I climbed up on the windowsill, carefully squeezed through the bars, and had a death grip as I looked down. I knew I would have to be careful. I hoped I would land on my feet. I said a quick prayer before jumping. Sure enough, I did land on my feet. But I did not go uninjured. I felt and heard a dull crunch in my left ankle, causing me to stumble. I wanted to scream, but I bit my lip and held back. I did not believe it was broken, but it was probably fractured. I used my gauze to quickly and sloppily wrap it up. The pain was immense, but I ran in the direction of the woods. I guess I was not as stealthy as I thought. I soon heard guards yelling at me, calling for me to come back. I heard one get on the radio to report that I had escaped, and I could hear rapid footsteps behind me. I tried to go faster. But my injury held me back and I fell forward, my face hitting the ground roughly. I felt two sets of men's hands grab me and drag me back to the psych ward. I screamed, kicked, and even bit to try and get them to let me go but it was to no avail. When I realized that they were just not going to take me back to my room, I screamed even louder. They were taking me to a therapy room. They threw me in and locked the door behind them. I had fallen to the floor, and once I staggered back up, I pounded on the door. I knew what was coming. One of the professionals was going to ice bathe me. I let out another scream of rage before hitting the door again with my fists. I turned around, expecting to see a bathtub and another door for the professional to come through. But to my surprise, there was nothing. The room was empty. What? What was this? I began to feel my anxiety act up again and I wanted to be sick. I looked up, hoping to find something that could get me out of there. And something burned inside of me when I noticed the security camera. Once I noticed it, I heard a voice come over an intercom. Patient number 1226, Shasta Joanne Gordon, it said. Isolation test commencing. There was a silence for a brief moment before it came back. Welcome, patient 1226. What? I screamed. Get me the fuck out of here, Dr. Ramos. I'd hoped someone would reply to me. I was not sure if anyone could hear me. What was this even for? I was horrified, to say the absolute least. I felt my stomach drop, and I ended up getting sick again. When I finished, I wiped my mouth with my arm, then looked back up at the camera. Oh, I hope you're enjoying the show, motherfucker. Do you think this will really work? Dr. Ramos asked her colleague next to her. He glanced to her, then back to the monitor, showing patient 1226 in the isolation room. Are you sure this is the right patient? He asked. Positive. She's been my patient for nearly a year now, she answered. 
She opened one of Shasta's files and showed the doctor her file. He read it, occasionally glancing back up to the monitor to check everything. Sixteen years old, blonde hair, green eyes, pale skin. This was the right girl. Allegedly, she is responsible for the murder of Derek Keegan Jordan, she added. And she isn't in the criminally insane wing, why? The doctor asked, raising a brow at Dr. Ramos. Well, because the authorities could not prove she did it. Yet so much alcohol in his system, it was hard to tell what killed him. His liver was nearly deteriorated, not to mention his lungs were blacker than night itself. Well, then what makes them think it was a murder? Just the way everything was set up. It's like Michael Jackson's death. Nearly everyone believes it was a murder, but nobody can prove it for sure. Not to mention she refuses to talk about it. It's like every time she does, she gives herself an anxiety attack. The doctor sighed and looked back to the monitor. The isolation will hopefully make her admit something, or at least get her to calm down. We'll need to change her room so she can't escape again. Dr. Ramos nodded and looked back to the monitor. Shasta had given up and was sitting in a corner, hugging her knees to her chest and trying to make herself breathe. Admittedly, Dr. Ramos felt somewhat remorseful for doing this to her patient, but they needed something. She refused to believe she was unfixable. She was not going to give up on this one. I looked up at the cameras watching me. My whole body trembled as if I were in extreme cold, and I said nothing. Why were they doing this? Out of all the things I have done, I've gotten things like ice baths as punishment. Why the hell would they isolate me? Just because I tried escaping? I rested my head against my knees, looking down at my shadowed torso. How long did they plan on keeping me in here? I could not hear what they were saying, even if they were saying anything. I set myself up for this, I suppose. I did not move for what felt like eons, and my ankle was in extreme pain. I forgot about that for a while, but I felt it throbbing after a while and remembered what I did. Eventually, they had to send someone to fix it, right? I looked up from my knees. Send someone in to fix my ankle, I told them, looking straight at the camera. I noticed the lens inside adjust the focus, and I returned to my sullen position. It took a good 15 minutes before a professional medic came in and told me to straighten out my injured leg. This doctor I recognized as Ramos' friend, Dr. Tyler Lee. She was a cute Asian woman, very sweet. She was not as pushy as Ramos, something I indulged in while she examined my ankle. She managed to get it in proper bandaging and told me after I get out she would look at it more closely. She then left me again into the unbearable silence of that room. The walls were as thick as usual, but it was like the door was just as worse. I suppose it was soundproof. I sat back against the wall again, glancing down at my hurt ankle. Did I seriously think I was going to get away with an injury like that? Hopes were too high, obviously. I cracked a smirk at myself, telling myself I was an idiot. I looked back to the camera. Still enjoying the show? I asked rhetorically, my tone annoyed and my expression rather sarcastic. You have to get the balls to give me my meds at some point, I remarked before looking up at nothing in particular at the ceiling. The room was more bland than the room I always met Dr. Ramos in. I looked down at my hospital band on my left wrist. Again, even if I had escaped... Did I really think that nobody would have brought me back if they saw that? I shook my head at myself, reading the band. It said my full name, birthday, admission date, and patient number. That number forever burned into my brain. Everything they did here, they labeled by the patient number. Just to not exploit everyone's problems, I guess. I remember my old roommate had explosive disorder and she tried to bash my head in with her bed frame. I do not belong here. Soon enough, I will get out of here.
They use this room to test patients for isolation and if they need in there or not. The patients in isolation are often schizophrenics, explosive disorders, clinical depressions, and multi-disorders. And considering all the things I supposedly tested positive for, I should have been in there a long time ago. Hell, if they think I committed murder, I should be with the criminally insane. Now, of course, nothing has been proved yet, and nothing will be, because I'm innocent. Four days went by, feeling like eons. I was slowly starting to lose it. If there was one thing I could not stand, it was being alone for too long. Even the unpleasant presence of my doctor was enough social interaction for me to not lose my sanity. I found myself constantly pacing the chamber, muttering nonsense to myself. I knew there were two ways out of this room. Cooperation and patience, or show my crazy and rush it. I began to have second thoughts about it. I constantly argued that there was nothing wrong with me, that I did not belong in this loony bin. But I could not stand it anymore. I needed a break from this place. I looked down at my nails. I had not been trimmed in a while, of course. Considerably long, and really strong. I had not taken all my medication in either. I could blame it on that, surely. I smirked to myself and turned to face the camera. You're watching this, yeah? I asked with a smile. Well, I got a show for you. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. I added and put a hand to my right cheek. Was I really about to do this? My heart beat faster against my sternum. I curled my fingers into my skin and impaled as I pressed in. Blood trickled down my cheek, and I hid my pain behind my eyes as I stared deep into the camera. I drug my nails down my cheek, causing four cuts to be made and the blood to drip down my neck and onto my scrubs. I repeated the process once I got down to my jawline. Like this? Is this what you wanted? I shouted at the camera, still keeping a hard stare at it. It took another time of me cutting open my own cheek before two doctors came in and forced my hands behind my back as the other examined my wounds. I struggled a little, hating the bare, cold hands on my skin. The blood was starting to pour and the cuts burned in my face. What have I done to myself? God, I'm so stupid. They took me to the examination room. My cheek was patched with peroxide, neosporin, and a large bandage. Dr. Lee took this opportunity to examine my ankle. She told me it was a hairline fracture and would heal within six weeks. I was so angry with myself. Sure, I was out of the chamber, but to what upgrade? I was escorted to a room in isolation, and I silently examined it as they shut the door behind me. Horribly bland. Worse than my first room. No extra bed, of course. Isolation meant no roommate. I went over to my new bed and sat on it. I looked around to observe. One single ceiling light, a bare nightstand. They did not even trust us with a lamp, of course. The only window was a small high window that was heavily barred. Nobody was getting through that unless they were a rat. I laid back, thinking about what I could do now. Being in isolation was going to be boring. Worse, I had no idea how long my sentence was. A week? A month? I could not handle a year. One patient in this wing carved another eyes out with a toothbrush shank. Could not survive here. Again, the door was as thick as the walls. The ringing of dead silence was the only sound I heard for a good hour as I sat on my bed. Eventually, a knock came about my door. I got up to open it. It was a male nurse. Patient 1226? He asked. That'd be me, I said, showing him my hospital band as per usual. He nodded and handed me my medications that I did not take, as well as a new bottle. 
Restoral? What do I need this for? I inquired. Dr. Ramos wrote a prescription. She was concerned about insomnia, so she recommends trying this for a bit. It's only 100 milligrams, he replied. My brow furrowed as I looked down at my medications. Prozac, Zoloft, and Restoral. Wonderful. Just what I needed, I guess. I thanked the nurse as he closed the door. I dry-swallowed my usual doses, tasting the chalky aftertaste and trying to clear my throat a bit. There had to be a way out of this. I was not sure how much longer I could stand it. A few days went by before Dr. Lee informed me that my isolation stay would be six months. Why did they think this was going to help at all? This was hell, to say the absolute least. I was also told that Dr. Ramos sent in a letter of resignation. Good riddance. I did not care how pretty or handsome any doctor I had was. If they pushed me to my limit, I hated them with every fiber of my being. I started seeing doctors and nurses less, only seeing them for the daily medication drop-off. I even began to lose track of the date and often mixed my days around. I occasionally would ask the nurse dropping off my medications what the day was, and would find myself very befuddled a lot of the time. One evening, I found myself staring blankly out of the small window high in the wall. I began remembering what my first escape attempt was like. The adrenaline rush, the excitement, the hopefulness I had. Now drained from me by medications that told me it was not okay to think that way. A part of me missed the euphoric idea of finally being out of this hellhole, but the other part kept telling me I could never pull that off again. I looked to my nightstand. Two empty cups sat side by side. One had half a cup of water. The other had two pills left. One lithium and one restoral. I typically took three lithiums, two phenergen, one zoloff, restoral, and lurisodone. I felt a wave of anger come over me, and I grabbed the pill cup and threw it against the wall. It hit the wall with a dull twack, and the pills spilled and rolled to various spots in the room. I began thinking about what was really wrong with me. Here I was, sitting in an isolated room in a mental institution. I had a bandage on my right cheek and bandages on my left ankle. I contemplated escaping again. I knew there was a desk just by the elevator downstairs, and there had to be someone working late and had their car keys sitting and waiting. It would be an easier escape, surely. My only issue would be trying to get out of my room. I got curious and went over to the wall where I threw my cup at. I pressed a hand against it. It was just thick drywall, easily broken by some force, I figured. I looked to my metal frame bed and got a smug smirk. Enough force, I could break the wall and get downstairs. I went over and pushed my mattress and covers off the frame and pushed the bed frame over to the opposite side of the room. Once I was sure it was against the wall, I gave it my all and pushed it against the wall. It loudly banged against it, but hardly made an indentation. Frustrated already, I repeated the process two more times before I decided this was not going to be so easy. I put the bed back to its original state, so no doctors would ask. I went over to the wall I tried breaking, and ran my fingers over the indentation. I felt another wave of anger, and I punched it. It scraped up my right hand's knuckles pretty well, but not too horribly, and I used my other hand to try to cover the slight bleeding. I then thought, maybe I could fake being sick. I took another look at my hand and smiled. That was the best excuse. I quickly decided to yell out in pain. I need a doctor. I screamed, hoping someone would hear me. One thing about this asylum was that they usually do a patient sweep for curfew around 10 o'clock. And thankfully, someone heard me and opened up the door. It was the male nurse that first gave me my restoral. He noticed my hand injury and decided to take me downstairs to an examination room. He took me down in the elevator, keeping a firm grip on one arm as he escorted me. 
But just as we passed the desk, I saw someone's car keys. I yanked out of his grip somehow and grabbed them up quickly. I rushed out the door, nearly tripping down the steps as I looked on the keys to figure out which car I was looking for. I had to hurry. He was coming for me. A Ford Focus. That's what I was looking for. I went to the only one in the lot and got in the driver's seat. I started it and pulled out. I gassed it, going down the road for a bit. And I really made it out. I should not have thought so fast. Just as I was going to pass the asylum for good, a deer came running into the road from a nearby forest. I did not know what to do, so I swerved and ended up hitting it. With the speed I was going, it ended up hitting against the windshield and breaking it almost entirely. I slammed on the brakes, making the deer body roll off the hood. I sat back in the polyester seat, looking at the damage in pure disbelief. I was so close. So close to freedom. I started cursing up and down and sideways as I heard sirens pull up. I should have known that the nurse would have called cops on me either way. Without hesitation, I got out and put my hands up behind my head as I faced the police cars. I said nothing as they cuffed me. They took me back to the institution and spoke with the male nurse. They told him the damage done. And I remember one mentioning they could just add this to my current trial case. I had forgotten. I would have to show up in court soon. Regardless, my hand wound was treated and I was locked back up in my room. They said they would deal with me in the morning. And I decided not to think about it and I went to bed. The next morning, I was greeted by two doctors who told me to hurry up and clean myself up. They had to escort me to the showers and hand me my new scrubs for the day. After that, they told me I had to appear in court regarding the whole reason I was even in the asylum, and concerning the night before his events. I rolled my eyes at the second remark, but had to consent anyway. I was taken in a police car, cuffed, and escorted by Dr. Lee and a state trooper. Once we were in the courthouse, I was taken out to be shown to the general public and court workers, and they all gave me disgusted looks, understandably for what I was being accused of. My lawyer even had a disappointed look on his face. He must have caught wind of what I had done the night before, and I gave him a shrug. The judge ordered for the court to be in session, and I was being charged for first-degree murder of my own brother, along with Grand Theft Auto. I silently wondered if they could get me for two escape attempts at a technical hospital. And at this point, I could either plead guilty and get away with 50 years plus six more months in the asylum, or plead not guilty and end up with life in that hellhole. The only reason this trial happened was because my brother's ex-girlfriend was trying to get something out of it and make herself look good. I constantly had the whole mental instability thing hanging over my head through this trial. Her lawyer took the stand and spoke. Ladies and gentlemen, this trial has been one hell of a ride. Shasta Joanne Gordon accused of murder to the first degree, and now added Grand Theft Auto as of approximately 10 o'clock last night. The evidence against her is the single thing needed to tie her to the murder, and I have it here for you she said. She then held up a large Ziploc baggie with an empty Budweiser bottle in it. My brow furrowed at her. What the hell is that supposed to mean? I asked. My lawyer gave me a look, and I just shrugged back at him before looking to Derek's ex-lawyer. This bottle had Miss Gordon's fingerprints on it. She is underage, and has never had alcohol traces in her system. She continued to argue. However, along with her fingerprints, it had the blood of her brother, Derek Keegan Gordon. As for other bottles found around the house, no others had her fingerprints other than this one. This bottle was found next to Derek's body. I bit my lip. You don't get it, bitch! I called out, causing a small uproar from the crowd behind me. Oh, I get it perfectly, 
she retaliated. This teenager is clearly guilty, she finally said before stepping down from the stand. Derek's ex gave me a smug smile and I gave her a scowl. You didn't see him suffer every day like I did, I yelled at her. She furrowed her brow at me with wide eyes. Order, the judge called out. Derek was already having a shitty life, and then you had to go break up with him, you scumbag. He drank like it was an open bar. He smoked more than two packs a day. Order. He was stressed because I was in his life. He's better off dead anyway, I continued. The crowd began to uproar and yell at me, to which I turned around and yelled right back at them. Order, the judge exclaimed a third time over the chaos, beating his gavel on its resting plate. He shook his head and looked at me. The defendant shall rise, he called. I stood with my lawyer and doctor. For once in this whole trial, my lawyer was speechless. Shasta Joanne Gordon, in the case of the murder of Derek Keegan Gordon and the incident of Grand Theft Auto, what do you plead? I took a moment. I knew I would not survive in prison, but I had a gut feeling that this was going to be the last time I hear wind of this ever again. Because I had a plan. I took a deep breath and exhaled before I answered that I pleaded guilty. The judge nodded and the jury agreed with me, finding me guilty as well. Once this whole thing was over, Dr. Lee and the state trooper escorted me back to the asylum. I knew I was going to get therapy for my actions. These whole therapy sessions were more like punishments to train us like dogs. I was dragged into an ice bathroom. The doctors there made me strip down and filled the tub with ice. I was then forced in. I was gasping for air as I sat. I should have been used to this kind of thing, but I really was not. This mental institution was in no means a safe haven for anyone. You did something wrong. You got this or worse. I remember one doctor accidentally fried one of my roommates with shock therapy. I watched as they made other patients get in as well. I could often tell when a patient was experiencing it for the first time, or if they were experienced with this kind of torture. Oftentimes, they would keep a person in there before they got frostbite, before their core temperature dropped immensely, or when the ice all melted. I was so used to it. I oftentimes was not allowed out until at least half of it melted. I sat there for hours before the doctors observing me was distracted by another patient started to freak out. And I took this opportunity and I gripped the sides of the tub with skin tight hold. I inhaled deeply and closed my eyes before forcing my head underneath the ice. The cold was insane and I exhaled. I continued to breathe in, hoping to drown myself. I felt hands try and pry my hands off the tub and try to force my body out of the tub. I remained resilient, keeping myself under. I felt my chest tighten with every breath I took. The pain was growing and I loved it. I grew closer and closer, accepting the pain and ready to experience the elation of death. I felt a cough coming and I allowed it to come up my throat. I opened my eyes to see red start to color the water. And now the pain was starting to actually hit me, and I was truly struggling to live. I heard a dull cracking, I coughed another time, and soon felt total relief. No pain, and the hands on me trying to pull me out stopped. Becoming brave, I finally arose from the water, taking a breath of oxygen. There was nobody in the room with me. I looked around purely bemused by this. I quickly got out of the freezing tub and I checked all the others. No other ice water, nobody else to be seen, and I decided to throw a towel around me as I peeked out into the door. Hello? I called out loudly. It was eerily quiet. Nobody in the main room and nobody at the desk. Just lights and the ringing silence. I was starting to feel a little anxious and I noticed someone walk through one room to go to another. 
It looked like a female nurse. Ma'am? I called after her. She did not even acknowledge me. I felt a chill run down my spine and I went to the front door. No cars, no busy streets. What was this? I stepped out and for once, nobody was in a hurry to get me back in. I looked down at my left ankle and realized it was still bandaged. I must have been dreaming. I looked at my right hand's knuckles, still bandaged. I felt my cheek, still bandaged. I cursed, realizing this had to be a dream. I shook my head and just carried on. If this was a dream, well, I might as well make the most of it. Dr. Lee looked to the male nurse with her. Holy shit! She gasped as Shasta's grip on the tub finally loosened and she pulled her out of the water. The girl was more pale than usual. Her expression looked a little frightened, but not too much. Dr. Lee looked to the nurse, who had his hand over his mouth in shock. Dr. Lee laid Shasta's body in the floor, checked her pulse. None to be found, so she attempted CPR. She pushed and pushed, but no luck. Shasta's pulse never returned. The pale-skinned, scrawny girl remained limp and lifeless. Blood trickled out of her nose and mouth, green eyes wide open. The blood was starting to get into her hair, coloring the blonde strands in a pinkish color. She's dead, the male nurse muttered. Oh my god. Dr. Lee shook her head. Go let someone know we have another, she said, gathering up Shasta's scrubs and laying them by the body. A few more doctors and professionals came in. Doctors escorted other patients out of the room, and the professionals took care of Shasta's body. Dr. Lee stood next to the male nurse and looked to him. Haley would be disappointed, she remarked, referring to Dr. Ramos. This is the third one this year, the male nurse added. Haley would have busted that bathtub to get her out. Well... Shasta always said she wanted out of here. She tried twice, Dr. Lee said. Now she's really out. For good. Why did she resort to suicide? Well, she did not want to see prison, I guess, Dr. Lee remarked. It's typical for teenagers to fear something like that. But her mind didn't let her think clearly. You know, all the medication she was on, of course. She really did need all of those? He asked. Her Prozac was the ringleader of all her medications, she replied. Something she neglected to take a lot. Shasta obsessed over death, always referring to it as a euphoria. Well, I guess she got what she wanted. He sighed, looking to the bathtub, now having a mixture of bodily fluids in the icy water. He thought about what drove Shasta to that point, and just shook his head. We should get this cleaned up, he finally said, Dr. Lee nodding.